Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm seeing our folks joining us and everybody populating into the webinar room. Welcome to Careers in Global Health. We're really looking forward to this discussion today. A few housekeeping notes I just put into the chat box that you can place any of your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. Please do that. I'll do my best to keep an eye on that. And also the session will be recorded and we will share the presentation in an email following up to everybody who has RSVP today. So welcome to Careers in Global Health. I'm gonna do quick introductions. We're gonna talk about what do we mean by global health? career opportunities in public health and specifically in the global health field. And then a little bit about our master public health program at the University of Vermont with the Larner College of Medicine. And we also have common questions that students ask when they're interested in joining the field of public health. So we'll go through those and a little bit more about the MPH program at UVM as well. My name is Nicola Willie Fenton. I'm the Content Marketing Manager at UVM's Continuing and Distance Education. I'll be helping to facilitate the conversation today. Joining me today is Dr. Kelsey Gleason. She is our Assistant Professor of Medicine in our Public Health Program. And she has a lot of experience in public health. We're going to hear some of the amazing travels and projects that she's worked on in the past and things she's working on today. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from Kelsey. And Dr. Langdon Lawrence also joins us as well. He is an Educator Assistant Professor professor and former clinical instructor in our UVM public health program as well. And he's a physician and he is a dad and Kelsey's a mom. I can't forget about that too. And we're so happy to have his expertise with us as well. And Vika Pleshkova, she helps to work with all of our public health students as well. She advises and helps to enroll in all of our program courses. And she is also a mom. And so we're happy to have her perspective in guiding our students. She'll help us um, really fill out the information at the end about the program itself. So let's get going. What do we mean by global health? I think that public health, no surprise, has been thrust into the public eye in the last year. And we've talked about epidemiology and biostatistics and other webinars and career opportunities. And I know we have Dr. Hart in our um, room as well, and she is an epidemiologist and she often says, People know what she does now. So we want to kind of peel back the layers a little bit and talk about what is global health and what do you do in that field? We're going to start with Dr. Gleason. How do you define that? And, and knowing that people in our audience might have exposure and have worked in global health, taken a course in global health, or none at all. So how do you define Thanks, that? Thanks, Nicole. Um, you know, I try not to define global health because it is so broad and there are so many different facets and areas of global health. When we think about global health in the news, we're thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic in India, right? That is global health. But global health is also improving healthcare access at a village level improving um, water and sanitation at a small community level. So it really depends on what area of global health you're in, which is how you define it. But overall, we define global health similarly to how we define public health here in America, which is that we are improving the health of populations rather than individuals. But it really depends on what population you're talking about, right? Are you talking about a really small village? Are you talking about a town, a city, or are you talking about an entire country? There's lots of different areas within global health that we'll talk about later, like different career tracks that you can go down. But it's so broad, but at the very essence of it is improving the health of communities worldwide. So you can do that through things like I mentioned, improving healthcare access or contributing towards humanitarian assistance. So that's for things like there's a global humanitarian disaster, a tsunami, a hurricane, um, a war, a conflict. That's humanitarian assistance. We also have a big area of global health that is maternal and child health. So specifically focus on moms and their kids. We know that infant mortality and maternal mortality is a really big issue globally. And so that is its own area of global health. Also, one of my um, favorite areas is in disaster risk reduction. So how can we make communities more resistant to the constant insults that they face from war or from the environment? And then finally, we have international development. So this is more of a financial end of things where we're 
using money and funds from more developed countries to be able to improve the infrastructure in lesser developed countries. So that's a long-winded answer to say it's really broad and it's really, um, it, it's a lot dependent on what area you are specifically interested in. Langton, I'd love to get your perspective on this too. Um, are there certain areas in global health that, that you have been more drawn to than others? Uh, sure. Um, I think Kelsey mentioned a couple of them. Uh, she was talking a little bit about providing care at the village level. And the first example that I'm going to share with the group um, really centered on exactly that. Um, and I think that's where some of the most meaningful long-term uh, changes can occur. Um, some of the other things that I've worked in, I, I have done humanitarian assistance and uh, disaster uh, intervention. And it's such a different experience. Um, it's it's obviously more acute. Um, you're really trying to just uh, help as best you can. Uh, you know that there's going to be problems. Um, and for I think in some ways it's almost less satisfying. Uh, at least maybe it depends on your personality. But um, uh, it's you know it's it's the difference between an emergency intervention and the long term care of a patient. You know that type of thing, um, and I'm I'm going to be touching on both of those areas when we. Uh, I want to just a while we're staying on this. Thank you, LinkedIn. Um, uh, while we're staying on this slide for a moment, um, can both of you describe your your backgrounds? Um, because I think it's always interesting that maybe you didn't set out to work in global health, um, but the path that you took to find this career path. Kelsey, could we start with you, and then we'll come back to LinkedIn. Sure. I was always really interested in global health. Um, but if I'm going to be honest, I probably wasn't interested in it for the right reasons, at least initially. I remember being in high school and in early college and being so drawn to the travel aspect and getting to experience new areas of the globe. I grew up in a small rural town in New Hampshire, and I was super eager to to get out. But then when I went to college and I studied abroad in the Brazilian Amazon, I realized it was really a lot less glamorous and sexy than I thought it would be. And I, and I made the decision right then and there that I was committing to this area, but that it wasn't exactly what I had dreamed up it would be in my head. And um, so I initially thought that I would go on to be a, a physician, but I found myself more and more drawn to environmental health. And so I actually went on and um, got a degree in environmental epidemiology with a global health focus, which allowed me to blend my interest in global health with my interest in environmental health and work on environmental health issues globally. Great, thank you. Langton, could you share your, your path to working in global health as well? Uh, sure. I'm, uh, I'm the proverbial uh, wanderer who eventually found his way to this field. Um, I was a passionate artist in high school, and I chose my college experience for the best art program that I could get into. And I'm talking about painting and drawing and photography and sculpture. Um, I spent two thirds of my college doing that. And on a kind of a lark, I blundered into picking up a second major in philosophy. Um, just because I wanted to read some of the some of these great writers. And there was a track in philosophy that let me also do some psychology. So I thought, hey, that's pretty good. So now I was an art major who was a philosophy major who was partially doing psychology. And part of the psychology major was spending time volunteering, taking care of high functioning, self injurious, autistic uh, people or people with autism. And that was a revolutionary experience for me. It absolutely transformed me uh, working with both the child psychiatrists and these kids on a regular basis. It was my first job out of college and I started to have this crazy harebrained idea. What if I was a doctor? What if I went and did that? And um, I really hadn't been with sick people. I hadn't done work in clinics. I, it was I, I, the whole thing, it was a blank slate. But I just had this sort of internal hunch. And so to test it, I uh, basically accessed a friend of a friend of a friend and found my way to the first group that I'm going to talk about when we eventually get there. Um, these two wonderful doctors uh, named Raj and Maybell Aroli who were working in India. 
and they took me in as first an observer and then their assistant. And uh, by the end of my time with them, I had really had a baptism by fire. Um, I had participated in multiple surgeries, deliveries. I was absolutely well informed about the importance of intervening with women and girls in the villages and the, the knock-on effects that that has with all the other uh, social issues that we want to touch on. Um, it was just a profound experience. And so maybe I'm putting the cart before the heart by getting too much into it, but um, that was the light that became the light at my end of my uh, tunnel. And I, I went back, I did the pre-meds, I went to med school, I did a family practice residency to mimic the training that Dr. Uh, the doctors Aroli had both had. And um, that was how I did it. I mean, and, and, and so uh, it was it was just really the opposite of, of, of setting out a plan and then just executing on the plan. It was a it was a process of sort of one adventure after the other and just finding yourself. Wow. Where you Thank you up. so much for sharing both of those experiences. It's so fascinating to see the path that people go um, towards work, whatever they're working towards, but in particular, global health is fascinating to me. So thank you both. Um, so let's come back to some of that experience that both of you have been talking about. Um, Kelsey, I, I believe this slide um, has images of the work that you have done. So why don't you just describe for people watching and participating, what kind of work have you done in global health? And I I also want you to answer what else are you doing now because I know you continue. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Nicole. Um, I chose these projects specifically because they're all so different. So again, to give you a preview of how there's no one track in global health. And even once you've established yourself that this is what you want to do with your career, you can do a lot of different projects with it, which is one of my favorite parts of the field. It's always interesting. Um, one of my all-time favorite projects that I've worked on was a peace-building project in East Timor, Timor-Leste, which is a tiny little island nation um, that actually it, it shares an island with um, a, a part of Indonesia. So it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's this beautiful tropical oasis, but it's been plagued with years and years of extremely violent conflict and genocide. And our public health project that we did was to not necessarily to be the peace builders, but to understand why still years after the supposed end to a conflict, there is still issues within communities. So from a global public health perspective, we went in and spoke with community members and did community-based assessments to understand why these communities still felt conflict with one another. And then we used that information and passed it off to local organizations for them to then be armed with the information and to be able to intervene in more culturally appropriate ways. I also worked on a really cool project on disaster disaster resilience in Haiti following the major earthquake there. And what that project was, was we were trying to understand how social cohesion impacts a community's ability to be resilient to these natural disasters. So as we all know, in Haiti, following this terrible humanitarian disaster, this earthquake, there, the entire country was devastated. But when you look at a more granular level, some communities were more devastated than others. And this is within Port-au-Prince, super close next to each other. Some communities within the city were better off than other communities. And we wanted to understand why. Because as we know, earthquakes are going to continue to happen. And they're going to continue to happen in low and, in, low and middle income countries. So we wanted to understand the actual aspects of the culture and the social cohesion that allow communities to improve their response. And then finally, another one of my favorite projects was partnering with public health educators on the Thai-Burma border to improve public health education within Burmese refugee camps. So these are students who are refugees from Burma who are living in a refugee camp in Thailand who are interested in promoting public health within their own community within the refugee camp. The problem is, is there's no formal education system, right? So within this refugee camp, these are really students and educators who have banded together to learn more about public health. 
And so what we did was we brought over students from America to partner with students from the Thai Burma border, these refugees, to learn from each other. Students in America, turns out they have things like fancy epidemiology and biostatistics knowledge, but they know nothing about what goes on on the ground. So this partnership was really cool to see the dynamic and how these students interacted and learned with one another. Thank you so much for sharing some of those examples. I can't wait to hear Langdon's examples too. But I also want to know, because I, I know you have some really exciting projects you're working on right now, and, and how the work in global health continues from a distance, really. Right. So right now um, I'm working on a, a couple of really cool projects. Of one related to COVID-19, I'm working with colleagues to better understand how the environment affects the spread and transmission of COVID-19 in 10 of the world's largest refugee camps. We're looking at this super high level. We are just using geospatial techniques to understand how the environment shapes and impacts the numbers of COVID-19 that we're seeing. We know that COVID is highly dependent on water sanitation and hygiene. So that's one of the things that we're looking at. Another cool project that I'm working on in the world's largest refugee camp, which is Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, is a similar project, but we are interested in how the environment and specifically forest cover impacts diarrheal incidents within refugee camps. So um, under five mortality is the leading cause of, or diarrhea is the leading cause of under five mortality globally, and particularly so in this refugee camp. And so we're wondering how this extreme deforestation that's happening around the camp is impacting the spread and transmission of diarrhea within the camp. Wow, thank you for sharing those two projects with us. Um, I wanted to also, you, you mentioned this, that it turned out to be very different than what you had in your head in terms of travel. It, you were traveling, but, but the idea behind global health and the reason for traveling, I think, was, was uh, morphed for you and changed. I find this slide very fascinating. Will you explain what you mean by this? Yeah, um, what I mean by this is, is I would caution you if you want to get into the field of global health to do it for the right reasons. There's really two different ways of, of doing global health work. One is kind of like what you see in the picture here is to, to get likes on your Instagram feed um, and to stay in high level hotels and travel the globe and not really do much. The other way is either integrating yourself in the community on in the ground, on the field, on the ground, in the field, or partnering with local organizations as implementing partners. So that kind of leads into your question, Nicole, where I can sit here in my house in Vermont and partner with colleagues in Bangladesh in different areas across the world a lot more effectively in many, many ways than if I were to hop on a plane. And the reasons behind that are not only financial, um, they're also environmental. Think about your environmental impact traveling to these, to these faraway places. But really, as global health professionals sitting in our cushy offices and our fancy buildings here in the US, we need to recognize that no matter how much time we spend on a plane or in a country, we're never going to understand the cultural nuances that exist within countries, which is why they need help in the first place. And that's why it's so important to recognize, again, I have the epidemiology knowledge, but I don't know what's going on in the field. And that's why it's important to have humility and to partner with these organizations and local implementing partners where they are actually the experts and you just lend what knowledge they need to you know, make a difference in the field. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective. And, and Dr. Lawrence, I know you, you share that um, perspective with Kelsey as well. We've talked a little bit about that. Um, 
So I, I'm really anxious and excited to hear what we're seeing here and, and a little bit about the different projects that you've worked on um, in, as, as a global health practitioner. Sure. And I was just thinking, I just had this thought uh, uh, just a second ago as we prepared to sort of have the baton passed off in your original slide about just how diverse the, the, the means are for being involved with global health. And, and Kelsey was listing, listing these, these fantastically interesting academic projects that she's been on with, with really sort of sophisticated questions to be asked and answered. And I was thinking how different um, the three things that I wanted to bring up really are. Uh, these experiences, uh, the one word that comes to my mind is experiential. They, I, it was about me going to places and participating in the project of just providing medical care. Uh, there were very few sort of overarching academic questions to be asked or answered. Uh, there were no public health papers to be published as a result. It was about just this really very sort of simple, straightforward provision of medical care. Um, and that that distinction strikes me somehow as as meaningful. Um, anyway, just just something to throw out as I as I begin. I started to talk about uh, my time in Jumket. Uh, Jumket is the, is the town in which uh, doctors Raj and Maybell Aroli uh, traveled after they finished medical school and finished uh, residency, and uh, two Indian doctors. And they literally had a fishing tackle box full of medicines and supplies, and they set them out under a tree and started treating people sometime in the mid 1960s. And uh, they added to their fishing tackle box, they added to their, you know, then it was a small structure. And within several decades, they had built this really fantastic hospital. Uh, the purpose of which was to take primarily the money that could be paid by what Dr. Roger Rowley called the second poorest people in the world behind North Africa to take mostly that money and use it to provide top-notch medical care within reason uh, to these patients uh, with a minimum of intrusion by NGOs, uh, government agencies, uh, foundations, and so on. And they really succeeded. Um, we, we talked about work at the village level, and that's what one of the things that makes the, the CRHP so special. Yes, they built a hospital, but that wasn't the point. Um, surrounding the hospital in a network of smaller towns uh, around Jamket was a series of clinics and feeding each of those clinics were villages. And this was all by design that one of the major problems in India with the provision of health care and, and just, just public health in general is the abysmal treatment of women and girls. Uh, it, is, it is really almost a form of institutionalized uh, long-term violence. Um, and, and I could just tell you one horror story after another, but it is it has literally been that way for millennia and it will continue that way unless there is strategic and tactically appropriate intervention. And what the Arolis sought to do was essentially link the treatment of women and girls to healthcare. And so in each of these villages, they appointed a village health worker who sort of in America would be like a combination of an EMT, a paramedic and a nurse practitioner. And it was the job of this village health workers to essentially triage medical problems and refer people in, provide basic care when they could. But the key was every single one of these village health workers was a woman. And that proved to be absolutely crucial in breaking this cycle of low self-esteem and, and lack of social power, because suddenly the most powerful person in the village that you had to go to if you really needed a, a problem solved was female. And there were knock-on effects with this uh, in terms of just the self-esteem of the girls who were watching this, this whole thing unfold. Um, it, it was just a really magnificent project that's taken place over you know four decades now. And uh, I, I suppose I should move on, but um, they, at one point they tried to sort of gauge, was this working, was this not working? And they, they tried to assess the self-esteem of the women in the catchment area for this, for this hospital. And there was no such thing in the, the local language for self-esteem. You, you couldn't really ask a question about that. And so instead they asked these women, in your next life, because the Hindu belief uh, is that we all reincarnate, 
in your next life, would you like to come back as a man or a woman? And overwhelmingly, the village health workers and their daughters said, I would like to come back as a woman. So it's just, it's a, it's a very beautiful thing that they've done. Um, I just, I continue to marvel at their, at, at what they achieved. Um, and, and maybe if I, if I spent too long talking about this, I'll, I'll short, I'll short circuit some of the other stuff, but I think that they are just exemplars of people providing appropriate, careful, beneficial care to communities that they know well uh, with just a super long-term uh, good outcome. Um, the next two things I wanted to talk about were essentially humanitarian and disaster interventions. Um, on Boxing Day, December 26th in 2005, uh, a massive earthquake occurred off the coast of Indonesia, um, which was I'm not a geologist, but it was 9.1 to 9.3 moment magnitude, which is, I guess, what they use when the Richter scale becomes no longer uh, of use. And the result was that an absolutely immense tsunami spread out across the Indian Ocean, causing catastrophic loss of life. Um, in the main uh, major city nearby the earthquake, uh, Banda Aceh on the tip of Indonesia, uh, 167,000 dead. Uh, 250,000 dead in the surrounding area, and this absolutely huge, uh, correspondingly huge humanitarian response ensued. Um, and what made the humanitarian response really quite difficult was that whole area had been the grounds of a regional insurgency. Um, so, it, I mean, it might be too far to call it a civil war, but or low intensity civil war, but but uh, there was there was conflict, and the people who were providing medical care had to negotiate um, this sort of passage between rebel groups and the army. Um, it was it was quite something, and uh, so I I got there, and most of the acute medical needs had been met. Um, sadly, those who were going to die had died; those who were going to live were alive. But there was immense psychological need, uh, just psychological trauma. Um, just as a as a prompt, the the fellow sitting in the right hand portion on the middle picture, these two gentlemen in the chairs, um, were interpreters. That was that was literally my clinic, which was under a tarp on the beach. Um, and the gentleman on the right is an interpreter. Um, he had luckily traveled with his wife inland to visit her relatives on the day of the wave, and the wave hit, and he and his wife and their immediate uh, children were fine. Every single other person in that man's family was killed. And there he was uh, two weeks later, helping me in clinic with an absolutely just, just um, how, how can you relate to that? How can you relate to losing your entire family? How can you even begin to comprehend that? And yet there he was, just total heroism. Um, I guess I'll just maybe move on super quickly to Louisiana. Um, as I'm sure most of the people listening know, uh, in 2005, August, a Category 5 hurricane uh, came up the Gulf of Mexico and hit New Orleans dead on Hurricane Katrina. It was the doomsday scenario that all the city planners had feared for decades. Um, the city of New Orleans is sunken due to uh, complicated hydrology of the Mississippi River. Um, the, the sea is being held back by a series of levees of varying qualities. The levees failed and uh, whole tracts of neighborhoods in New Orleans were suddenly inundated and uh, there was significant loss of life. Uh, people literally drowning in their second floors of their homes and in their attics. Um, there was a over the course of about 10 days a mass exodus of people away from the city and the you know downtown New Orleans and folks were housed throughout the state. Um, just to show you uh, that that top right picture, that map, which is a little dim. Um, I went down with a group that was connected to both Harvard and the Red Cross, and it was our job to fan out into the whole network of shelters, um, which ranged from stadiums, which I've shown there, to uh, churches and um, uh, just even people's basements, and set in place the surveillance system to uh, watch for and, if necessary, immediately treat um, major communicable disease outbreaks. 
Um, people were very afraid of that uh, with good reason. Um, as it turned out, either we did our job or we got lucky, but um, it wasn't a problem. And in the second portion of the time I was there, it was uh, going back to these same shelters and doing needs assessments. What did these folks, what was their true situation? How was it going to be best that we help them? Uh, what did they need? What did they not need? Um, and uh, just three super meaningful experiences to me, which I, I hope will provide you a little bit of a sample of what's out there if this is a direction you want to go in. I think it, it goes back to Kelsey's point in the beginning, and you reminded us that as well, Langdon, that it's a very diverse field and the experiences that you can have and the support that you can provide can look so different in so many different locations, even sitting at your um, home office in Vermont. Um, I also want to thank you. Thank you both for sharing those experiences, Langdon, especially for sharing those um, experiences that you have done. Um, cautionary tale. I think it goes along a little bit with what Kelsey was saying before, that it, it isn't a glamorous and it's not for social media. It's not the intention of global health and working in this field. Um, share with me, I think this might be Langdon as well, share with me um, what's the intention here of this slide? So, so you guys asked me for my slides last week, and at the time I had planned on telling you in detail uh, the story of this woman, which is emblematic of, of so much of what is both good and bad with humanitarian aid. And I, I had a week to think about it, to let it sit with me, and I decided that uh, I really wasn't comfortable sharing the actual specifics of her case. Um, I suppose, uh, you know, for ethical reasons, uh, that's really the best tag I can put on that. Um, but I think it's it's best not to sort of get too far down on, into the case of one person. I will say, when I see her face uh, years later, I think of the fact that with every humanitarian aid intervention, there are promises made to people face to face, eye to eye, uh, that that the teams who were there will 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 be there, will continue to be there, um, that that they will go on to support these folks. And shamefully, sadly, tragically, uh, a portion of those problem, those promises are not kept. Um, and this just raises, for me, the whole specter of what's sometimes referred to as the dark side of humanitarian intervention. Um, just staying at sort of a high altitude, the international community, the global community needs humanitarian interventions. It needs people who are willing to get in a plane and go in when there's a tsunami or a hurricane. But uh, the process has to happen with a, with a sober, wide awake understanding that along with good intentions and along with the goods that are, that are passed along, there are unintentional harms. And we could literally do a whole week long seminar on what those harms are and, and how they arise. Um, but the, the biggest problems come when people pretend that they don't exist. Um, and so, so just to even be aware of them is the first step. There's one terrific uh, group at Harvard called the Humanitarian Academy that is trying to systematize the study of, of how to increase the goods and decrease the harms and really adopt a, a, a you know, field-wide set of best practices. Um, I, I can't praise their efforts enough. It's, it's what's needed. But um, just for the people coming to this for the first time, keep in mind, it's, it's not all good. And, and if you lose track of the fact that it's not all good, you may be, end up part of the problem. Right. Thank you for sharing that perspective. <laughs> yeah, Kelsey, did you, did you, anything you wanted to share um, just as we've kind of looked back a little bit and, and also as Langdon just did have, help us look forward a little bit too? Not a whole lot to add. It's, it's just to, to reiterate to have, you know, even if you do have great intentions, as I, as I mentioned, as an absolute prerequisite before, despite the best intentions, you can screw up. Despite your best intentions, you may find yourself affiliated with a project that is doing more harm than good. And I think that in global health and in any other field that you end up in, recognizing that is really important. And um, 
sticking up for local communities and people impacted is is what's really important. Thank you. I appreciate you adding that perspective. Um, just wanted to, I know, thank you, Vika, for answering some questions um, with Julia in the chat. If there are other questions that you may have um, specific for the work that Langdon has done, that Kelsey has done, we're going to talk a little bit about the MPH program, and Vika's going to share a lot of information about the program here in just a minute. But if there's any other questions, um, I'm going to keep an eye on that chat box. So please do ask them. We'll allow a little time at the end, too. But this is your chance to um, ask any questions of Kelsey and Langdon as well. So something you mentioned, um, Dr. Gleason, that you have also trained in epidemiology. And so I think that the two, global health and epi, seem to go hand in hand. Can you just explain that a little bit more for us? Sure. As I, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the um, you know, most obvious global health careers would be, or global health projects right now that's in the news, is what's happening in India with COVID-19. That is a pretty clear, cut and dry global health epidemiology issue. Epidemiologists are working on this. Global health professionals are working on this. It's a lot of crunching numbers, right? And so in that sense, global health and epidemiology and public health are, are all interconnected in some different ways. But we can also use epidemiological techniques for non-communicable diseases or even outcomes that aren't specifically health-related as you would conventionally think of a health-related outcome. So for example, the... Um, the disaster resilience project that I worked on in Haiti, our outcome was not something like COVID-19. It was not incidents of heart attack or maternal mortality. Our outcome was disaster resilience, but we used epidemiological techniques to get there. So you can still use biostats and epi to arrive at um, really solid scientific explanations for global health issues that you're seeing. So it's all connected in a variety of different ways. Great. Thank you so much. Um, let's, let's, before we jump to a video, let's, Megan just asked a question. Um, so let's address that real quick. Megan asked, how do you think wastewater based epidemiology will fit into the future of public health tools? Yeah, Kelsey? I think that's a great question. And I'm, I'm also affiliated with a group here in Vermont that's working on that, that very question. I think as a predictive modeling tool, it can be really, really great. I think we haven't quite gotten there um, in terms of perfecting it, but I think that we're, we're pretty close. So the idea here, for those not familiar, is to be able to monitor the wastewater data and anticipate when we're seeing viral loads in the wastewater in communities, we will then be able to proactively anticipate an outbreak that is about to happen in a community, which will allow public health professionals, both locally and globally, to better prepare for different outbreaks. Thank you, Dr. Gleason. Thank you, Megan, for that great question. So we're going to um, pause for a moment. We're going to show a video from one of our current students, um, Isabel, is as she goes by, Tominelli. And so um, stick with us because we're going to come right back. And Vika has a lot to share about the program itself. But we're just going to turn off our cameras real quick. Um, and then we'll turn our cameras right back on after the video so that we can play the video full screen for you. And so stick around. We'll be right back after this video from Isa. UVM does a lot more to consider the fact that the experiences of their public health students will be different. The field of public health that I'm most interested in is global health, and the way I got there was from my undergraduate studies in microbiology and immunology. One thing that attracted me to the online MPH program is the fact that I'm so independent. My schedule is pretty sporadic, 
So just knowing that I would have the flexibility to plan around that was great. I actually find that I have a better relationship with my professors at UVM who are all online than I ever had with any professors in my undergrad experience. The program does a really good job to make up for the non-traditional social aspects of learning. So there's a lot of discussion board and you know using Microsoft Teams and Zoom and interacting with other students. So I think that's really unique. I think the school has done a great job adapting to those um, needs during a pandemic. It takes discipline, but I think it's so rewarding to be able to have the independence and the flexibility to live your life and also go to school and be a master's student. Here they really care about their students and I think especially coming from a public health discipline in pandemic times especially our professors have been extremely caring about what's going on in our lives extremely accommodating and letting us know too that you know we're human beings as well we're also struggling the stress is not lost on us we're here for you as your professors but moreover we're here for you as your colleagues and as your teammates and we're here to support you and ensure your success. great welcome back everybody um just note Langdon and Kelsey, everybody's muted. So when you're going to talk again, you just want to unmute. So just wanted to give a little glimpse as to um, a student who's focused in global health and um, why she's interested in it and the support that our faculty like uh, Kelsey and Langdon and Vika provide to our students. Um, so we're going to dive a little bit more into the program, the Master of Public Health program at UVM. And so I just wanted to come back for a moment to Kelsey because we've talked a, a lot about um, opportunities in global health. Is, is there anything else on this list that you just wanted to touch on as other career opportunities for people as well? No, I think this list really um, does a great job of, of summarizing the main career options. One of the most glaring, obvious errors that I left off of this slide is specifically what Langdon does, right? He's a physician and he does public health practice in, in global health. So that's a super obvious way that um, you guys can get involved in, in public health on a global scale. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to be a physician. Langdon can probably talk to this more, but you could be a, a nurse or a nurse practitioner or a PA or anything in between. Um, the stuff that I know most about are careers in research think tanks. So as Langdon mentioned, one of the, the best ones is at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative or the Harvard Humanitarian Academy. You could also go into consulting. They do things um, that are more financially related to international development. Academia, obviously Langdon and I both chose that route. You could work for the US government. USAID or um, other affiliates are, are really um, good at promoting change internationally. You could work for the United Nations. The military is actually a huge player in the international humanitarian response or a non-governmental agency. Um, you could work at one based in the United States or based locally Great. in the Thank field. you. Thank you for sharing a little bit more detail on that list. Um, I wanna toss over to Vika because we're gonna dive a little bit more into um, the MPH program at UVM and Larner College of Medicine. Um, this is an important slide, I think, Vika, because we help students in our program. And, and I'm hoping that you can guide us a little bit more on that information. What do we mean by career services and career opportunities that we support in our program? Sure. So UVM MPH degree is a generalist program. That means we cover all the areas that are part of the the public health and, and not just the global health. Um, you will have our faculty expertise to guide you in the right direction. You have a lot of electives to choose from. If you want to specifically focus on global health, then we can help you and um, Dr. Gleason can be your faculty advisor. Having said that, there are a lot of um, job opportunities with this MPH because it is a generalist program. And we do have a career coach, Heather, who works with our, our students at the end of the program and helps them connect with the UVM 
with MPH alums who are working in the field now, connect them with the, with the like-minded like individuals, help you with preparing your resume, cover letters, interviewing skills, and even salary negotiations. So there are a lot of opportunities um, by completing this MPH because you can take it in any Such direction. Such a great segue into this slide. Thank you so much, Vika. Kelsey, can you just walk us through the next couple of slides? Um, we don't need to spend a lot of time on, but just um, Vika mentioned a generalist program. What do we mean by that? And, and what kind of are some of the specifics here for UVM's MPH program? What we mean by that is there's no concentration in a specific area. So when you leave UVM's MPH, you will have a solid base understanding of epidemiology, biostatistics, environmental health, global health, social behavioral sciences, which will allow you, so that's the generalist aspect, right? And that will allow you to be flexible in the field of public health and really versatile in your career, which is a huge selling point for employers. Um, as, as we mentioned, you have electives, so you can, you know, add in different electives in your area of interest, but um, overall it's, it's a generalist program. And, and Dr. Carney, who leads our program, always talks about the areas of excellence. Um, what, do, what does she mean? What by she that? means by that is that even though we are a generalist program, we have these um, areas of foundational knowledge, our areas of excellence, where we have courses that will allow you to excel in any discipline that you choose. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that as well. And Vika made mention of this just a few minutes ago is the academic and career coaching. Vika guides on the academic coaching side and then Heather Palo supports on the career coaching side. Vika, what does that mean in terms of the kind of support that you provide? We heard a little bit about what Heather does, but what kind of academic mm -hmm. support do you provide for students? Um, I typically guide the students from the point of their in inquiry before they even apply to the program. I'm happy to meet with the students, prospective students, answer any of the questions they might have, uh, guide them through the application process. And then once they become students, then we go over the whole course plan, how long they would like to take in the program, what their life is like, and how many courses they would be um, they would like to take per semester. We look at the, at the student as a whole because a lot of our um, MPH students are working professionals, have families, have other obligations, so we would really cater the program to your needs. It's very flexible, like you heard Isla saying in the video. Um, it's very personalized. There is no cohort. You can start the program any time of the year, spring, summer, or fall, and based on when you start the program, we will cater the courses um, to meet your needs. You have five years to graduate. Most of the, our students complete the program within two to three years. Um, you're very flexible. You can take a break. You can take a semester off or you can take a year off if you'd like. Um, and the financial aid and tuition are available for, for working adults. So the federal, the federal um, aid is available. There are no scholarships or fellowships from UVM, unfortunately. And I'll be happy to answer other questions that are on the slide, Nicole. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Vika, because I know this one always, I, I would suspect that a year ago we might have this question more, how do online courses work? But now I, I, don't, I don't know if we have that question as much anymore. Um, but, but how do online courses work in our MPH program? Maybe we'll go down that path. Sure. So our program is entirely online. At no point during the program, you have to come to UVM campus. The courses are offered asynchronously, which means you do work on your own time and you do not have to be logged in at a certain time to access the course. You are, you're flexible. You have um, weekly modules. You still have assignments and papers to complete. Of course, you will have the deadlines, but you do the work on your own time. And that's why it's, it, it offers a great flexibility for working individuals or students who are doing um, any other courses. And as Dr. Gleason mentioned, we do not have a concentration within our MPH, but you certainly can take electives as you would need to take three electives to complete the program. You can uh, choose one area of those areas of excellence to create your own mini concentration, so to speak. And as I mentioned before, the internships are not available, unfortunately. 
But one of the great things is the applied practice. Um, can you explain what that is, the, the program that I know Heather works really closely with our students on too? Sure. So one of the national guidelines for MPH programs is having the applied practice experience. Um, and Dr. Gleason can tell you more about it, but that's a requirement of 20 hours at least working in the public health field, completing um, a reflection letter and a rubric, make sure that you cover all the competencies that are required for public health. And that experience is usually um, usually happens at the end of the MPH program and it part is part of the student's culminating project experience. Great. Thank you for sharing that as well. We do have a question from Julia. I suspect we get this question a lot too. Um, if you have a master's degree in something else, would any of the credits transfer, Vika? Yes, if that degree was earned outside of the University of Vermont, you can transfer up to nine credits. So it means three graduate level courses approved by the program director. So we probably need to see the syllabi for the courses before we can say for sure that we will accept them as transfer credits. Great, thank you. And thank you, Julia, for that question. And we have on the slide um, just a few of the admissions requirements and all this information, of course, is on our website. But if you are interested um, in learning more, there's lots of information on the website. But if you're thinking, okay, what do I need to do to get going on my application? Can you just briefly, Vika, walk us through those steps to apply? Sure, the application is very simple. We don't ask for any standardized tests. You submit an online application through Graduate Admissions Office, $65 fee, three letters of recommendation, um, resume, cover letter, and official transcripts. And we will review your application if you can send us copies of your transcripts, but eventually you have to send official ones in. Um, so, but we don't, need, we don't need to wait for all the official documents to come through. And I think this is an important slide as well, just thinking of timing, right? Thinking of how much time might you need to get your transcripts and, and get everything together and when you might want to start that program. Can you just share with us some of the deadlines for people? Sure. Uh, we're still accepting summer applications. The first summer session starts on May 24th, but you can also take a course on the second summer session, which will start on July 6th. And of course, we're accepting fall applications right now up until August 1st. Um, and the out-of-state students pay a differentiated tuition, which is a lot less than the, the typical out-of-state students pay uh, at the university. You would only be paying 927 per credit compared to 1700. And the Vermont residents pay their standard tuition rate, 68.3 per credit. Great. And all this- and I'm seeing there's a question from yeah, go ahead. That's exactly where I was going to go. Go for it, Vika. <laughs> From James, quickly. Um, there is no statute of limitation on the credits or the the length of the time that has passed since you've taken those credits, if that's your question. Great. Good. Looks like we, we answered that for James. Thank you so much. So I just want to have an opportunity for any additional questions, either for Vika on real program specifics, um, application deadlines, or Langdon and Kelsey before we wrap up. Um, so just wanna give a few minutes for that as well. I do wanna come back. Um, Kelsey, Vika did mention, um, you know, you could add more information about the applied practice. What are some of the kinds of opportunities that our students um, get involved in as at the end of the program for that applied practice? So it, the applied practice experience is really a mini internship of your own choosing. And so it's totally broad. It is within any area of public health that you are interested in as a student. And so students often work with local organizations that are close to their homes, but we've also had people partner with international organizations remotely. Um, a, a big popular one is with state organizations. So State Department of Health um, and various divisions within it, but also NGOs or other um, non-governmental think tanks within the international health community. Great. And, and Kelsey, walk, through, walk us through the support that faculty provides to guide students through that applied practice. They work directly with um, different faculty members. Well, um, so Heather Palo and I co-direct the applied practice experience and we are really here as faculty to be a sounding board for students. We are there to provide them with the resources necessary for them to independently achieve this 
applied practice experience. So we do not help, we do not find the, the experiences for them. Students are responsible for doing that, but we're here to provide the logistical support and also the cheerleading whenever someone needs it. Yeah, we all need that as well. And we have many of those on our MPH faculty and staff as well. So it looks like questions are, are quiet. So thank you everybody who have joined today and asked questions and learned more about global health. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Thank you, Dr. Gleason. Thank you, Vika, for sharing all of your experiences and um, perspectives on the wonderful career opportunity and field of public health and specifically global health. I wish you all good health and a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much, everybody.